Oh, that's great. That's beautiful. Turn to Titus, if you would, the book of Titus. We've been in there. It's going to be a short eight weeks in Titus. I think you've uh, made your way halfway through it. So you should give yourself some type of an award for that. As you're turning to Titus chapter 2, kids can make their way to uh, the children's uh, church downstairs. That's uh, four-year-old to fourth grade. And um, it's Titus 2. Hope you're kind of catching on the theme of it. Uh, can you cut that back just a little bit? That, that'd be great. Um, hope you can, the, the theme of it is it's good works. It's one of the pastoral epistles. Some of you know that. It's uh, 1st, 2nd Timothy, and Titus. It's written to pastors. But don't think that it's then just for pastors. It's for how the church is to run. It's how we're to do things in the church. And so Titus is really helpful to us. The theme is maintaining good works or, um, let's see, maintaining good works, uh, the functioning of the church, and it has three chapters, pretty easy. First one is administrative-like. Uh, the second one that we're looking at uh, today is teaching about in God's Word and grace, and then the third is really focused on good works. And so there you go. It's very simple. The church needs to have administration and be ordered in a particular way. And the second one, focus on God's Word, as well as focusing on um, uh, the teaching and making sure the grace is the message, and then finally, the good works that we do in our community. So that's the overall movement, but today's is pretty incredible. It's been said that these few verses that we're looking at today is the absolute highlight of the book of Titus. So, if you've been bored the weeks leading up to today, don't worry, today's the highlight. It's not going to get better, though. So, in the future, maybe not as good as today. This is it. This is a huge passage for us, and here's the trick, it's going to take some thought. So, you kind of hope to come here today and not think a lot, but I hope you had coffee, a little caffeine somehow, in some way, your energy drink, because you're going to need it. We're going to think through this passage because what Paul does, he makes three really fantastic points on grace, then he says them again in one section. You won't see it right away. So like in poetry, it would be A, B, C, A, B, C says it in a different way, the same thing twice. So that's why in your notes, it, uh, I have the uh, squared. So if you have the notes there, it's grace squared, but then the first point is grace appeared, squared, it's twice. Second point is grace teaches us to say no to certain things, squared, says it twice. Then grace teaches us yes to things, and he says that twice. A healthy church is going to be known for being grace-filled. There's two sides. If you take neutral here in the center, you have mercy. Mercy doesn't give you the punishment that you deserve. So by not giving you the punishment that you deserve, it takes you to neutral. Gets rid of the bad. That's God's mercy. God's mercy is that because of our sin, we deserve punishment. His mercy says, don't punish them. Neutral. Grace is now giving you what you don't deserve. It's giving you what you have not earned. So the blessing and the goodness of God is given to us freely. You're accepted before God, not because of anything you've done, but because of grace. You didn't get punished, mercy. You are accepted before God because of His grace. So your week fluctuates week to week, month to month, probably year to year. There are some where you're just, you're walking with the Lord, like you honestly look in the mirror in the morning, you're like, I think I'm Mother Teresa reincarnated. I am so good. I mean, there's those days where you're just hitting on all cylinders. But then there's other days that you're like, you know what, I, am I even a believer? 
am, am I even, I'm just doing like everything wrong. We go through this based on a thousand things. You and I are accepted before God exactly the same through all of that because it has nothing to do with that. Your acceptance. God has given you His goodness and His kindness undeserved, unearned. Yeah, but some days I kind of earn it more than others. Never earned. The Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. To think that some days I earn it? Okay, that's hard to swallow. It's very important that we know that we are only accepted before God because of His grace, unearned, undeserved favor. That's it. But then we turn and we face people. And you and I are to accept people, others, unearned, undeserved. And that is typically not the path of a church. Got to live up to a certain standard. It's just that you, you don't fit. You're not, you're not doing the obvious things that you should be doing. And the acceptance and the love is so based on works and doing and kick, uh, checking boxes. And we are that way when we feel that way with God. Because it's going to be a mirror. It's going to reflect it. That which we feel we are accepted before God is how we're going to play it out with others. If you wake up some days and you're just convinced that God is just mad at you and his love for you, he's just, he rolls his eyes every time you come back. If you feel that way, you're going to treat people that way. Because that's graceless. But that's the, that's the way we play. That's how I view it. And if I view it that way with myself, with God, I'm going to be that way with others. God's grace says, it had nothing to do with you. I love you for you. Well, let me, let me clean up. No, don't clean up. That has nothing to do with it. Just the way you are, God loves you. Now, out of that love... Because of that acceptance that we know as filthy as we are and undeserving we are of his kindness, because of that, we start to straighten up our life because we want to please him. We want to live good. We want to do good. We want to clean up our life out of a gratitude and thanks for his acceptance, not in order to be accepted. Are you agreeing with me on this? Are we all right on this? Okay, we can leave right now if you want, if you really agree. Nope, nope. A couple of heads went up and went, really? Is he really going to let us go if I say yes? I. So take a look at this passage. Fantastic. They are verses, chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. It's not a lot. Follow along if you have your Bible there, your phone open. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Now we're going to say it all again. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness, to purify himself a people for his own possession, uh, for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Heavenly Father, we're pausing for just a moment. We've read your word. Thank you. It's so refreshing. It's so freeing. And as we're sitting here, some with memories of things they've done just yesterday or this week that are dishonoring to you. 
They feel unacceptable. For those of us who are prideful and think, of course we're acceptable, look at the good we're doing. Heavenly Father, I pray that you correct both of those thinkings. That we celebrate you and your goodness and your kindness and the grace. In Jesus' name, amen. So take a look at the first point. It is that grace has appeared. Grace is unearned, undeserved favor. You didn't have it coming. It's unearned, undeserved favor to you. That's his grace. It's not because you were baptized correctly. It's not because you honor a certain day of the week and others don't. It's not because of the name Baptist. It's not because, well, it might be because we're like in southwest Pennsylvania. That's definitely an advantage but not to earn any extra acceptance before God. It's nothing. It is grace only. For the grace of God has appeared that brings salvation to all men. The grace of God has appeared. It brings salvation. So those today that are looking for, let's define it, salvation. Because of sin, we're separated from God. There's no union any longer with God. Salvation is a reunion into a relationship with God. That's salvation. You say, well, salvation is assurance. I'm going to heaven someday. Yep, down the line, that is true. Salvation is heaven when you die. But keep saying, why? Why is that good? Why heaven then? I mean, what's the the advantage? Well, because God's there. Okay, keep going. God's there. What's the advantage? I get to see him and be with him. Now you're getting really close. Salvation is that I have been destined to a life outside of God. And when you take God out of the picture, life is horrible. In fact, the more God and God's ways and God's will is out of the picture, you pull all that out, you know what you're left with? Hell. That's what hell is. Hell is the absence of the presence of God. Salvation is relationship with God. And I'll tell you what we have done as a church very often is we've reduced it to two things. Very often you'll hear hear people say salvation is forgiveness of sin and uh, eternal life, heaven, heaven. Forgiveness of sin, heaven. In fact, I was listening to a great little podcast with Johnny Erickson Tata. Uh, His primary uh, lawyer is a very good friend of ours. So we kind of follow her a little bit just because he's really close to her and it's just fun to hear what's going on. And she is the sweetest soul in the world, right? Paraplegic, loves the Lord. She's amazing. But it was so classic, typical. She shared the gospel. She always does. I love that about her. And it was, if you want to have your sins forgiven and go to heaven, pray and receive Jesus. And I thought, there it is. And it's true. That isn't the primary beauty of salvation, but it's true. It almost leaves you, that view leaves you right now just to fend for yourself. I get a salvation from God so I can go to heaven someday. Yeah, that's terrific, but I got to go to work today. I got to get into a car that may not start i got to have a relationship that is leaving me empty. Like, what do I do today? Salvation is a relationship with God that is otherwise impossible because of sin in our life. Well, how do we get that? How can I have a relationship with God? Salvation. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. 
How is salvation possible? By the unearned, undeserved favor of God. Period. That's salvation. Do you believe that you've not earned it? Right? Am I right? Is that your salvation? Am I not saying what you live? There's two types of grace. You know what these are. You just may not know the words of it. Sorry, AJ, I I keep messing you up. It keeps fading away, and then he keeps turning up, and the poor guy's trying to keep up with it. There's common grace, or what's called efficacious grace. Two different types of grace. Common grace would be what's going on outside right now. It rains on the wicked and on the righteous. That's common grace. The goodness of, just name it, air, a glass of water. That's common grace. And God is behind that. That's why we give thanks at a a meal. That's the reason for that. It's because of common grace. We're stopping to appreciate the fact that I get to eat this. Lord, thank you. We're recognizing the daily blessings are from God, common grace. But then there's efficacious or efficient grace. Some refer to it as sufficient grace. That is a special application of grace. It's in this text, and it's applied to the one who through Jesus has salvation. That is special grace. That's efficient grace. That's beyond Everybody in the world needs it. Everybody in the world gets their doses and various degrees of common grace. But for relationship with God, it's only through God's special grace. It says, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, classic passage, Or Romans 5, we've been justified through faith. Now we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access through faith. See, he keeps saying it over and over. You and I have access to God only one way. It's faith trusting in his goodness because he's given it to us. That's it. And whether or not you are living a life that's not real impressive or or a dual life, that would be common today. You know, we show different sides of us to different groups of people that we're a part of, and you feel really guilty about that. It's not a bad idea to feel guilty about that. None of that has anything to do with being accepted before God in His love. We're created to live in communion with God. That was the whole point. Sin entered in and interrupted it. It's the end of the story. It was over. Intended to be relationship with God, sin came into our lives and we're forever separated as far as we're concerned. But then... The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. It's His grace. We receive it. How many of you would say you actually know the date of when you received God's grace? When you put your faith in Him and it clicked, how many of you could actually name, you know, basically a date? Let me see your hand. Yeah, many can. How many know it? You know you're in the grace, you've received His grace, you have communion with God, but you really can't name a particular time. Just go ahead and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not uncommon. Not uncommon. You're in the family of God at that point, and you're fully accepted. All of those wonderful benefits of being in the family of God are there for you because of your faith in Him. You need to be confident of that today. Not in yourself, but confident in Him. As much as we believe that, 
with a date, without a date. But you know it. You'd almost die. You'd say, no, I know as a fact that my, the grace of God has saved me. As much as we'll say that and know that, we then beat ourselves up day after day for not living up to being accepted before God. That is a very sad, and that's a very tough place to be. I'm there in and out of it too. You know, you wake up and you're like, oh, I'm just not worthy of Him. I'm just going to eat a bowl of worms today because that's all I deserve. And we get into this and we feel so bad for ourselves that we don't deserve it. No, we've never said that you deserved it. You've never deserved it. And just because you're living better this week than you were last week, you don't deserve it more this week than last week. It's the same. It's the grace of God has appeared. There was a dear soul, her name, uh, Elvina Hall. She was 45 years old, uh, I believe East Coast. I think she's buried in New Jersey. She, this was in the 1800s. She was sitting in a church service, and she took the hymn book, and she started writing in the front of it. I didn't know you were allowed to do that. Are we allowed to do that? Highly discouraged. John, highly discouraged. <laughs> I love it. He's like, don't do that. God will fully accept you for doing it, but John and I won't. No, we will show no grace. Just don't write in it. So anyway, you know this story. I know you do. Uh, Elvina Hall wrote in it uh, during the service and went up to the pastor and showed it to him. And he goes, hey, that's pretty good. Go to the organist. The organist looked at it and he says, I just came up with this tune and let's see if these two go together. And they literally then on the spot, these were the lyrics written in front of the hymn book, the hymn book that I wish I had, actually. She wrote, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin left a crimson stain. That's like a red stain. But he washed it white as snow. Isn't that beautiful? So you can doodle during a sermon. That's what that means. You can. Something great's going to come out. Now, if you're writing, oh, I need to get a gallon of milk. That's not, don't write that in the hymn book. Just write that in your phone. Leave yourself a note. Let me show you what's going on in this passage then. Something that's kind of fun is he states everything twice. And so, verse 13. So, verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, brings salvation for all people. But then 13 says waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I think he's referring to second coming. I think he's referring to the second appearance. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. He gave himself to buy us back. That's what the word redeem. He gave to buy us back. Salvation is through Jesus Christ that glorious appearing. But then verse 2 or 12, the second point, it keeps going. It's one sentence. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age trains us to renounce ungodliness. Wait a minute, who's supposed to train us to renounce the bad things in our life? There are those today, because it's an epidemic, that are addicted to things on the internet, and it's on your phone, so you have access to it everywhere and anywhere. What is it that's going to get you to renounce these things that you're doing? Renounce means really say no to it and turn away and get away from it. What is going to teach us to do that? What's going to make us get away from lawlessness? What's going to, what's going to help the guy 
to get away from the things that they're looking at the internet? What's going to help the woman from, whether it's fantasizing or thinking, what's going to help us from trying to get ahead and have wrong priorities in life and the sin that is so creeping into our lives and the lives of our church and families? What teaches us to stop doing that? Parents help. That's a great tool. Parents, you're keeping your kids, your grandkids, you're talking about blockers on the internet that help. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. Your coach. Man, that's what some... How many of you were a coach in your life? Uh, a sports-like coach? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you guys are like, you guys are like the, the moms and dads of a lot of kids, weren't you? Kind of like parenting those that many didn't have and... Man, that's helpful. That's very helpful. That's great. We love a good coach, a parent, a church. But this says, for the grace, the unearned, undeserved favor of God has appeared, bringing reunion back with God for people, training us to renounce ungodliness and lawlessness. It's that same unearned, undeserved favor of God. Grace in our lives is what cleans us. So we'll go to God's grace for salvation, and we're like, oh, thank you, you're so good to me, and I receive you into my life, and thank you for saving me. I have a relationship with you now. And then we turn around and go, oh, okay, now show me the checklist. Let me start attempting to stop doing certain things in my life, and we fail at it. So, because we fail at stopping to do those things that we're doing, we then are forced to hide them. So now we're just hiding secret areas of our lives because we just can't stop doing it. For that person... You're relying on your strength and you're relying on great tips that you've heard on how to stop doing whatever it is that you need to stop doing or thinking, you're rel- and it's not working. Of course it's not, because it's the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. It's His undeserved unearned favor and kindness is what works through us to get us to stop doing things. St. Augustine said this. St. Augustine, 4th century uh, uh, North Africa. Nothing whatever pertaining to godliness and real holiness can be accomplished without grace. Grace. Grace is a key to this. Let's go more contemporary. This is John Piper. As we receive the undeserved favor of God, as His love refreshes, then grace is in the enabling gift of God to not sin. Grace is power, not just pardon. We think of the pardon. God's grace has pardoned me, and so I can have a relationship with God. Absolutely true, but God's grace is also power for you to stop doing things that you know and you even want to stop doing. We just can't teach it. We'll teach our kids. We're supposed to. So we do. We teach them, and that's good. Let's keep doing that. But that's head. It's consequence. This is good. We're getting patterns. This is all good and healthy. But what's that, what's that story of the little kid who's forced to sit down finally, and he finally sits, and he goes, well, I'm sitting on the outside, but I am standing on the inside, right? Well, how do you change the inside? We'll stop doing something that we shouldn't do, but we stop doing it on the outside, but our heart is still there. It'll come back. How do you change that? 
The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. So let's put ourselves in the grace of God, wallow in it, and as we wallow in the grace of God, it's changing us and teaching us that we want to say no to certain things. It's not just pardon, it's power. Now, some of you might have a fabulous question, which would be, how? Like, on paper, it sounds so right, but how do we do it? Well, first of all, we could ask a lot of people in this room, because a lot of people in this room, living in God's grace, has had it power to change their lives. Am I right about that? How many of you, when you came to know Jesus and you've received his grace, your life actually changed? Yeah. So we're, we are testimony to it. What we're talking about are the workings of it. How did it happen? Because somebody watches that and they're like, oh, he just stopped. He just stopped drinking. It was amazing. That was incredible. I'm going to follow that example and I'm going to stop drinking. That's not what had him stop drinking. It was the flowing of God's grace in their life that created the stop drinking. Do you see the difference? So we hear a wonderful story of someone whose life has just been transformed, and we want to pattern ourselves after them and not do those things either. So we imitate the behavior. It wasn't the behavior. It was the grace in the life that created it. The change of behavior was just the byproduct of the flowing of grace in their life. So it's back to how. Literally, as, as simple and as beautiful as you sitting in the morning and you, you, find, you do that time, whether you get up earlier or whatever you have to do, I have a friend who always got under his desk. That was his thing. He's a big guy. And he goes, I just, there's something about, I get under my desk because I feel like since I'm under there, and I'm thinking, yeah, I'd fall asleep. He goes, no, 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 no. I, I get under there. The phone rings. I don't really think of it because it's way up there. And I'm like, okay, that's weird. That's a little odd. However it is that we open up, and we go, here I am. You love me, don't you? He goes, oh, more than I could ever tell you. I've been messing up. He goes, yeah, come here. I'm like, really? Yeah, come here. I know you've been messing up, but come here. Let me just hold you. That's grace. This is all grace. And I'm looking at it, and I'm reading, I'm going, oh, you are so good to me. I'm reliving the grace experience in my life on a regular basis. You could really even take the prayer of salvation that you prayed. There's only like a small phrase of that that wouldn't be relevant to pray every day. The only part that's not relevant to pray every day is the part where we say, come into my life. Because he's already there. Oh, God, I'm a, I'm a sinner. Okay, that fits. I need you. Yep. I, I love Jesus. Thank you for dying for me. I trust you for eternal life. I trust you that I have a relationship with my Father because of Jesus. Why is that not relevant every day? It's reliving the grace moment. And say, now I want to read your word. I'm in a relationship with you, and I've been, I've been bad. But I'm in a relationship with you because, because of your kindness and grace and your goodness. So we read. And we just read whatever, a psalm a day, a proverb a day. It seems as though history of the church, history of the church, many 
almost most believers read a proverb a day, a psalm a day. I've discovered that. Maybe you've discovered it as well. It's just part of their reading. So if that's all you did, a psalm, and just sit, and what you're doing is you're reading it, and this is the wallowing in the grace. Oh, you're speaking to me. This is God speaking to me. Karl Barth, the theologian of this last century, he said the Word of God is God's Word in such a way that when it speaks, God speaks. So it's God speaking directly to you, and we sit and we listen to it. And it changes our thoughts. It changes our desires. It changes where we want to go, what we want to do. And we do this regularly. So then we want to walk through our day in this wallowing of grace. That's why a a secular radio station, a secular TV show, nothing wrong with those things. I mean, it could be, maybe, maybe not. But what ultimately is wrong with it is that we get our minds set in God's grace, we close it, and then we throw on something and listen to, and that just cleans out what we just read. That's why Christian radio is a pretty good idea. That's why putting Christian music on is not a bad idea because it's reinforcing this living and wallowing in the grace. And the focus is that. The focus is not stop sinning, stop the addiction. The focus is I want to live in God's grace, live in His unearned, undeserved favor because it's beyond pardon, it's power. And as we live in it, We watch those things disappear. We end up not even wanting those things anymore. We're right now without grace. We're giving it up reluctantly. I better stop that. It's bad for me. Yeah, good idea. But if you want a lasting change, the grace of God has appeared, brings salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. So, he says everything twice. So there is, look in your Bible again, verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. That's A, B. The next one would be midway towards the end of verse 14. It's to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify himself, a people of his own, to purify, to make clean Get rid of the lawlessness. Get rid of the ungodliness. Take a look at the third point. I told you I was going to make you think today. Sorry about that. I pro- We're going to do a veggie tale soon. How about that? To make up for it. Like in two weeks, we'll do a veggie tale. And then you'll be like, oh, good. I don't want it to think. I just want to watch them march around the city and watch it drop. Okay, here's the other thing it does. The grace of God has appeared. It brings salvation. That same grace that brings salvation teaches us to say no to ungodliness. But it also, third point, teaches us to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. Not only does it eliminate the bad, the things that you shouldn't be doing, you know what they are, we don't need to list them. Helps us, God's grace, salvation, helps us eliminate those, but then God's grace also, the positive, to live self controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. So a guy dies and goes to heaven. Who meets him at the gate? It's always Peter, right? So Peter's at the gate, and um, Peter says, okay, here you are. This is how it works, is you need 100 points to get in. So you tell me good things that you've done, and as you tell me good things that you've done, I'll assign the number of points that you earned. Guy's like, oh, I think we're good. He says, all right, I was married to the same lady for 50 years, never cheated, never even in my heart, just loved her. Peter goes, that is really terrific. Well done. That is, 
That's three points. Guy goes, seriously? I only got three points out of that? I mean, like, if, <laughs> like have you met her? I mean, that is unbelievable. <laughs> three points. And he's like, oh, boy, I started up strong, but okay. So he says, well, I attended church my whole life. I supported the ministry with tithe. I usually did it joyfully. I went to church services. Peter says, that's pretty good, terrific. He goes, that is certainly worth a point. A point? (laughs) So he says, "Um, I started a soup kitchen in my city. I worked at a shelter for homeless. Guy says, fantastic, two more points. Now this guy is livid. He goes, two points. At this rate, the only way I'm going to get in is by the grace of God. (laughs) And I wish that we could see our good works that way. Because we're comparing to each other. Because my good works are really good because I'm comparing it to somebody maybe who's not. That's not our standard. God's grace for salvation, God's grace, living in God's grace, not just pardon, but power, God's grace teaches us to say no to things, but then God's grace also then teaches us how to do the good. He says it twice. So the first time is, let's see. So the first one is, it's training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Here it was, is, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. He says it more precise at the end of verse 14. And to purify himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. God's grace for salvation, only unearned, undeserved. God's grace is what cleans us, gets rid of the bad. It's also God's grace that produces the good in us. And the word zealous there, which is in just about every Bible, they use that word. It's, and I love when that happens. Um, I think NIV might say uh, eager to do good. That's, that's pretty fitting. That, that one's good. It's literally zealous. I mean, that's it. It's zealous. It's good. It's enthusiastic to do good works. Eager. I'm not always that way. Right? Don't we do good works out of obligation? Right? It kind of comes and goes. And then we feel great afterwards, right? We're like, I'm so glad I went. That was so good for me, and I felt good. But I'm not always eager. What changes? Is it me? Do I get down on myself because I'm not eager? The grace. It's the grace. Grace for salvation. Grace to say no to the wrong. And grace makes us eager or zealous to do good things. Let me end with this thought. There's a book I read years ago, uh, Philip Yancey. Anyone read much of Philip Yancey? A little bit? Yeah. Uh, he actually has 15 million books in print, so he's, he's, not a, he's not a nobody. But Philip Yancey's a little unusual, a little, um, uh, he writes in a fun way. It's very unique the way he writes. Um, his book, What's So Amazing About Grace. Have you read it? Yeah, it's fantastic. What's so amazing about grace? You'll read that and read some of the things that he did in trying to get the story of grace out and try to get his arms around, and it's, it's refreshing. There's a lot of great books on grace. What's so amazing about grace is definitely going to be high on the list. This is what he says in it. Grace means there is nothing we can do to make God love us more. And grace means there is nothing we can do to make God love us less. Grace means that God already loves us as much as an infinite God can possibly love. That's you today. 
He loves you as much as he ever will, and it's not going to alter based on what you do or what you're thinking or what you're planning because that's the definition of grace. It's unearned and it's undeserved. He loves you today. That's our message. He loves you. He accepts you. You may be a filthy mess because of what's in your... He throws his arms around you as much as he does everybody else. And he goes, just come here. Just stay with me. And the longer we're with him, the longer we're enjoying, it comes beyond the pardon of everything that we've done, relationship with God. He empowers us to clean our life and then to add all the great things and even so much as to be eager to do what's good. Let's pray. Let's bow in prayer. If you've never received the grace of God, don't leave without it. If you've never received the grace of God, I pray that you would do that today. Heavenly Father, we're asking that you would help us to live in your grace, more in your grace. Help us to receive your loving kindness and be free to pass it on to others. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us. Sing one last song together. And will you stand?